Hi, so I'm Edith Joaquin Hans Goden from the University of Eindhoven. Um, I will talk about OpenML, which is a platform for network machine learning. I will also talk towards uh, future work towards automating machine learning through this platform. First, let's go back a few centuries uh, to the time where Galileo Galilei discovered the rings of Saturn. Now, we're scientists here, and what, what, would you, what, what, what would be the first thing that you do when you make a major discovery like this? We try and publish it. Right. Try to publish it. We try to publish it. Very good. Tweet about it. To tweet about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Galileo did something of the sort. Um, he didn't publish it. But what he did is he wrote down his discovery uh, in Latin and then scrambled all the letters and then sent out uh, this string of letters to all his astronomer rivals. And indeed, this is actually sort of like a tweet, right? It's uh, scientific discoveries in 140 characters or less. And what is ensured is that he could still build better telescope, do more explorations, but if somebody else made the same discovery, he could go back and say, see the paper I sent out last year, if you descramble the letters, you will see ours first. So in those days, there was absolutely no reason for scientists to publish their knowledge. There was nothing in them for them. This changed gradually in the 17th century, um, also to the work of the Royal Society. So they were kind of tired of um, all, all these people announcing they made great discoveries, but not proving it. Right? So they said, OK, if you make a discovery, you come here, you show it, and you show how you do it. We, build, we make reports, uh, we start journals. So uh, you explain what you did, you show how you did it so we can repeat it. Uh, and this completely changed uh, the way we do science. And nowadays, we do want to get our, our ideas out as uh, quickly as possible, right? It also changed the economy. Before, you needed to be a wealthy person to be a scientist. Then, if you were smart and you were good, you could build a reputation and use a reputation to uh, land a good job at university or to attract funding from uh, wealthy people, kings and uh, noblemen to fund your research. Now we are 300 years later and the question is, is the printing press still the best medium for science? Especially is it the best medium for machine learning? Because the code and the data is way too complex, so we have to publish it separately. The experiment details we can put into a paper are very scant, very undetailed. All the results you put in papers, tables, figures, they're very unmentionable. You cannot do anything with it afterwards. It's very hard to produce work based on that data or to reuse it for other kind of explorations. The papers cannot be updated. You cannot have a discussion uh, about it right away. Or you have to go to Twitter or something else. And also the impact that your paper has, it's very hard to see. You get citations, but that doesn't show the real impact of your and of course, the publication bias. There's so much work that, that does not get published, especially negative results that are very important to, to, also, to also know about. They don't get published in scientific uh, journals. This creates a bunch of problems, and today uh, it creates big gaps in data driven science. Right? So you, you can imagine the data scientists, the machine learners, the statisticians mathematicians, they develop techniques to analyze data. And this is very important because all, basically all major sciences now are data driven. They collect huge amounts of uh, data um, to look for, uh, to study phenomena, to, uh, to look for patterns and so on. You've got the domain scientists, these are your neuroscientists, your astronomers, your medical researchers, right? They collect this huge amount of information and they need the, the algorithms to, to analyze it to analyze the data, and you have soft uh, computer scientists that actually uh, take the algorithms and build them as something people can use, uh, so that that's very robust and can be used on, uh, by many different people. But there are gaps, right? Because the domain scientist, he he knows some he knows some machine learning, he knows some statistics, uh, but he is not sure about the latest and best techniques that are being developed here. Why? Because they're in papers. They're very hard to read about. You need to spend a lot of time to go to literature to know what's, what are the best uh, techniques. You also need to experiment a lot with code, if you can get the code in the first place. Um, so it, it's really hard for them to know which are the best techniques. 
Um, and the result is that while they have hugely complex data sets, they try simple uh, models on them, right? And they, they, they do collaborate with data scientists. This is typically small scale collaboration. Uh, this is not the same as having access to the whole knowledge of the data science community. Data scientists, on the other hand, they don't speak the language of the domain scientists. They don't know if they have a good algorithm where it would be best used because they have no idea what domain scientists are doing. They don't speak the language. They don't know where the data is. There are huge um, scientific databases with lots of valuable information, but data scientists typically don't know how to access the information. Also, because you need a lot of background knowledge for that. Um, so the result is that. Domain scientists have complex data and use simple algorithms, while data scientists they use usually complex algorithms on very simple data sets. Typically, these are data sets from the 90s or 20 years ago that you can still find. There's a huge uh, loss of, of uh, potential here. Right? Also, if you go to industry, if you're Google or Facebook, you have access to a lot of talent, a lot of data, you have no problem. But if you're a small company and you have data analysis, you have the same problems, right? You don't know. Um, who to talk to, who are, who are the, the key people to talk to for a certain um, topic. You don't know which techniques you should better use and so on. So this, is also, this gap also affects the industry a lot. Should we care? Pretty much yes, because um, there's, this is a, 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 um, an article from a scientist about medical science. And basically what they found is that uh, over 85% of all publications in uh, medical science cannot be used. They either do, the results are either false or not, not unactionable, unreproducible, cannot be used in real life. And so they analyzed what makes uh, a paper, a good paper, or a bad paper, and they saw that while well, findings are less likely to be true if studies are small and few collaborators, if the effect sizes are reported are very small, if they are very flexible in their design of their studies and analyzing the outcomes, um, and specifically if multiple teams are like, chasing statistical significance, like the oscillation for 0.05 p value, then it doesn't simply doesn't mean that there is actually any significance there. So, if you want to increase credibility, they say, you should have large-scale interdisciplinary collaboration. Medical researchers, computer scientists, anybody build large collaboration so you have all the talent that you need to do a large study. This is easy, but it's the best way to uh, increase credibility of study. You need a replication study. It should be easy to uh, reproduce uh, the work of others. Uh, data should be registered, should be shared, so people can uh, can use it for other things, but also to check uh, the results that are published. You need better statistical methods and models, and um, better design of studies, and good training in how to use them. This also happens in physics. This is, for instance, plasma physics. So here we um, uh, study solar flares. So this, the sun regularly uh, expels plasma and throws it at the Earth. Uh, and so to detect that and study the effect, they have um, satellite configurations that are orbiting the Earth, and these cost billions of dollars, right? to put them out there. And they measure uh, the effect of plasma at the, on the magnetosphere. Uh, this ends up in terabytes of uh, um, sensor data streams. And what happens next is that somebody manually goes to look at these uh, the streams and annotates them, labels them, uh, marks where certain interesting things are happening. So they have these huge billion dollar uh, satellites, data streams in, and then we have to wait for somebody to label them. This is first of all very wasteful, very slow, and if the sun is about to throw plasma at me, maybe I want to know, don't want to wait for somebody to actually label them manually. How can we do this differently? So maybe somebody knows this person. This is Tim Gowers. Uh, one of the he's a field medalist, one of the the, the great mathematicians of our age. And one day he was stuck on a very hard, century-old mathematics problem. And uh, instead of just putting it into his drawer, he said, "Well, I have this blog, so I can just put all my ideas, my partial results. I put it in my blog, 
and anybody in the world can come help me solve this hard problem. Right? It took uh, a few hours today uh, before the first comments uh, started streaming in, and within a few days there were uh, tens, maybe hundreds of people actually uh, making suggestions, reformulating the problem, running simulations, um, um, recasting the problems in, in, uh, in other mathematical frameworks so they can be solved differently, proving partial results and so on. This is amazing to see how quickly this collaboration um, developed and in less than 40 days they solved the problem. They actually solved a harder problem than the original problem. But does that mean that the Fermat's last theorem would have been solved in uh, 40 weeks if they didn't been using these kind of techniques? It really depends on the problem, right? Yeah. yeah. It, like, it, they tried it for, uh, to prove whether e, n is not equal to np and that didn't work. Uh, typically because that's like a problem where there's a huge amount of money attached to it and that people don't want to collaborate in the first place. Right, uh, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Sorry, Thank you. interesting thought. Um, another example is the Slow Initial Sky Survey. So this is a telescope uh, that slowly scans uh, the whole universe, the whole sky. And after a month, all the data is pushed into the Sky Server. So you can go online, there's a web browser, you can point to any point in the sky and you can see all the images that are taken of all different wavelengths. So you can so it's a complete atlas of the universe. And and so you broadcast data and the idea is while well, in the previous case you had a problem and you want to connect the minds of many people to solve a problem, here you have data and you publish it hoping that other people will find interesting uses for this data. And this turned out to be spot on because there are thousands of papers uh, that are being published based on this data and hence also thousands of citations for the people uh, that collect the data. Um, and these papers are typically about problems that you could have solved otherwise, but it would have, been, it would, it would have taken years to do that, right? For instance, uh, there were two astronomers that were uh, thinking about whether two black holes could orbit around each other. Uh, instead of running simulations and asking for um, um, telescope time, it takes a long time, uh, ask for, for funding, they just went to the sky server, downloaded data, and then built a machine, uh, data mining algorithm that looked for these patterns happening, and they found several examples of orbiting black holes in the universe. Right? Just by having this data there, people will use it to find, uh, to answer questions, to make discoveries, and do it much faster than you could otherwise ever do. Also interestingly is that this server has over a million distinct users, while there are only about 10,000 astronomers in the world, professional astronomers. So 99% of the people that use the Sky server are um, amateurs, uh, enthusia enthusiasts, uh, people who are just interested in looking at the galaxies. And this gave them an idea, because they have a problem with um, labeling their data. They take about a million images of galaxies, uh, and to do their analysis, they need to label them, right? They need to say, okay, this is a ball galaxy, this is a beam galaxy, that's a left-turning spiral or a right-turning spiral, and so on. Uh, and first, I had a PhD student that manually looked at the pictures and manually labeled them, which takes a longer time to do if you have to label a million of them. Um, it's also error prone because you get very bored very quickly. Um, and so instead what they did is they built a web page where you can get a short introduction to galaxies and then you are shown an image and you can classify it. You can just click through all the galaxies in the universe and classify them one at a time. It was a huge success. Uh, they had, at some point they had over 70,000 classifications per hour. It actually melted, uh, it, 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 uh, melted the server that they had running for it. Um, so, so it was a huge success. What I did not expect was that uh, these amateur astronomers, um, they were making their own discoveries. For instance, there was a Dutch school teacher called Henkel Achkel who uh, discovered these green blobs in the sky. So she asked, so what are these green blobs? And the initial reaction was, it's probably just noise, uh, some things on, on, on the lens that maybe uh, uh, has been caught in the images. But then she said, no, I don't think so, because I've seen this lots and lots of time happening. More people started looking at that, the, the, the astronom astronomical uh, community was interested, they looked at it, and they found out that actually it's a new kind of galaxy that they didn't know before. This is then they also find uh, other things like clouds of, of um, 
gas, gas that reflect images from pulsars, uh, light from pulsars and so on. They made several discoveries uh, entirely this way. If you, want to, if you want to know more, it's a good book, very good book, called Network Science by Michael Nielsen. You can read it. The question is, why does this work? Uh, and the question is, and the answer is that um, many discoveries in science are made by accident or partial accident. Something funny that you notice that makes you think um, that you weren't expecting. And normally this happens maybe once in a while, some, some very occasionally you make these serendipitous discoveries entirely by accident. But if you have a million eyes looking at your data, the chance that you make such a discovery, that you make a connection that other people did not make before, becomes very large. So if you broadcast your data, if you broadcast IDs, this fostered these spontaneous unexpected discoveries. Because what's very hard for one scientist may be easy for another. If I'm a scientist that just happens to have this data set um, that I'm analyzing, maybe I don't see all the connection, but if somebody else looks at it, he sees something that I don't see. If it would, if, if it would take um, maybe a week for me to learn about the machine learning algorithm to try on this, somebody else already knows this and can run this experiment in seconds and, and just tell me the result. If you connect the minds of many scientists, all their expertise overlaps, then you can solve basically any problem uh, by just having the right minds connected. How do you do that? First of all, you have to remove friction. Right? This is why the traditional uh, way of publishing only papers doesn't really pan out, because it's just too much work for me to find the data, to understand uh, the algorithm, to download the code, just too much friction. You have to remove all of that. Right? So first you need an organized body of compatible information. Uh, all the data should be um, in uh, similar formats. Uh, it, should, it should be easy to find, it should be compatible. If you have tools, it should, should also be easy to find, easy to run, and so on. It should, it should all be online so you can just um, find it easily and talk to people about it. It must be possible to make micro-contributions. If I see a problem, I can maybe think, okay, I have this algorithm that I just developed, I can just run it on this data which takes me only a couple of seconds to run, I just have to push the button. So I can make a contribution that's useful for other people in seconds. If it's well organized, if it doesn't take me days to actually r get the data, run the algorithm, give the data to somebody else and so on. You need easy organized communication, you, need, you want to have quick uh, responses when you're analyzing something, and you should also track who did what and give credit because no scientist wants to give all this knowledge away for free so there should be a way uh, for people to get the proper credit for the work they do. This uh, led us to build OpenML. So OpenML is a platform uh, for machine learning. It's worldwide. Uh, it means I can uh, release some data or uh, publish an algorithm and anybody in the world can immediately use it and run it uh, if I run experiments with my algorithm, somebody in the US can immediately download them and reuse them and so on. Right? So it's meant to be network science, but right? it should be a frictionless environment for machine learning research. Uh, it's organized, so all the experiments are, are organized online. The link to the data, link to the code, link to the people. So I can just get the data, get the people, get the code, talk to the people. It's all reproducible. Uh, if I want to rerun an experiment, probably else, if somebody else wants to rerun my experiment, it's easy to do. It's easy to use because we integrate it into machine learning environments. If, if you use our, our Python libraries, our, our Rekka or Nine, whatever, um, we integrate OpenML to these tools so you, you, you can just run your experiments and the tool will take care of uploading all the experiments to the platform and download the data. It allows many different kinds of uh, contributions, right? You can upload a single data set, a single algorithm, a single experiment. Uh, there's, there's no need to write a whole paper, right? You can just that, submit a single experiment. Uh, there's easy communication because every data set, algorithm, experiment has its own discussion page. So you can uh, talk to the people involved. Uh, we track reputation, so we track how much uh, your work is downloaded, reused with that length, and so on. Um, and it's real time. Right? You can instantly share all your results online. You can do it openly, or maybe you want to create a circle of researchers if you work in a paper, maybe you want to uh, make it have a smaller circle um, to, to work on something until you publish it and you can make it public. 
new website. It's called openmail.org. Uh, this is the front page. I will give you a quick demo of what it uh, looks like. Uh, so we have data sets. So if you're a scientist, you can upload easily a new data set, or you can look, look for them online. Then you can create tasks in which you define what you want to do with the data. For instance, you want to classify um, some events in the data. Flows are code. They're um, uh, algorithms or workflows or scripts um, that can take a task, run it, and then produ produce the right result. Because the task also tells you what the result should be. And you have runs, runs are just your experiments, right? Everything, uh, anytime you, you, you run a flow on a, on, a, on a task, you get a result, and every single result is called a run, okay? So, data can broadcast their data, and, and sorry, scientists can broadcast their data. In the moment, OpenML gets the data, what it does, it will check, it will check the data, whether it looks okay, it will analyze it, compute all kinds of statistical features, it will annotate it, version it, and it will index it for, for easy search. And if you go to OpenML, yeah, I can click on data sets, and is there a network? Yeah, okay. So here you get a list of all the data sets. So you can, well, Iris happens to be very popular in education, so it has a lot of runs. Uh, but for all the, you have a diabetes data set, you have uh, solar flare, these are, these are very typical of machine learning research actually. Uh, but if you go down the list, you will also find a lot of data sets on all kinds of problems. Um, and you can do a search on the topic of the data, you can look for very large data sets, there's all kinds of filters you can add to it and so on. So, and if you then click on any of these data sets, you get a page per data set. Um, so here we have data sets uh, autos, it's about auto industry apparently. Um, so the OpenL does, it uh, tells you what the format is, who uploaded it and so on. There's a wiki, so if you click edit here you can add the, descri add the description of the data set and, and include all the information that you want. Uh, every, in a tabular data set all the features are analyzed, so you see all the features of the data set. Uh, you can see what the class distribution is, what the numerical distribution is, so you can see what for nominal, you can see what the, the number of missing values is, and you can see all kinds of distribution data. This is very useful to, um, to spot problems in the data to see whether your algorithm can actually run, run on data or not. Right. So, um, next to um, data sets, we have tasks. So, tasks are basically containers which have the data in there. They have a description of what you should do with the data. So if you do classification, which are the trained test faults to use, um, trained test uh, samples to use, um, uh, what you should upload, should you upload a model, should you upload predictions, uh, and all the procedures need to follow. Uh, tasks are machine readable, so tools can just take a task, analyze it, download the necessary data, uh, run algorithms on it, and then automatically upload all the results back to the server. And interestingly, this creates um, a real-time collaborative challenge. Um, so if you have a problem, um, you can have many people try to build the best um, model on it, uh, and OpenL keeps track of who does the best uh, solving this problem. So here, for instance, we have a uh, task. This is for click prediction, so this is about websites, and you want to predict whether somebody will click on, on, on the link. Um, Okay, so here you see OpenML analyzes uh, all the results, right? So every dot here is a model, and it, it's evaluated. In this case, it's evaluated by uh, AUC, area on the rock curve. Uh, you can also hover over it. If you click on it, you can see the full, the full details. So here you see all the different machine learning models that have been used. Uh, you can see how good they are, so the, the more to write, the better. You can see the, the effect of different uh, parameter values and so on. So from here you can click on the, the flow, and then you see the algorithm that's being used. Or you can click on the run, and you can see the details of the run. Also, um, we, tr we track who contributed what. So here you see a timeline. So any, any of these dots here 
is again a model. You can see who built it. You can see what the performance is, how fast the, the model is to train. Uh, here you see performance, here you see time. Uh, so you see uh, in the beginning um, who built the first models. And you can see over time people improving it. And what's different from, uh, from classical uh, data mining challenges is that all these are open. So you can click on any results. Uh, you can look at what people did. You can learn from that. You can improve other people's code and uh, maybe uh, have a better model. And you see all these people learning from each other and trying to build a better model. You can see over time how the, the top performance goes up. You can, you can even see as uh, singular persons. This guy is gradually improving uh, the results in the course of a day. So uh, next, um, yeah. next we have flows. So flows are wrappers around um, algorithms um, that can read a task and upload a result. And you can either upload a flow, or you, but you don't need to. Yeah. Many uh, machine learning algorithms are already part of machine learning libraries, and we put plugins to those libraries so you can just um, uh, take a task, give it to the give it to the environment, and the, the environment will take care of downloading the data, uh, making sure that you have the right evaluations, and then we'll upload the results if if you uh, build an algorithm. So you just have to to do the data science. You just have to think about which would the best algorithms be, how should I tune the parameters, how should I uh, do pre-processing and so on, and the environment takes care of anything else. So we have uh, a REST API, we also have Java, Python, and R APIs. It, there are different kinds of tools, right? If you use like Amoa, uh, we have just plugin and you can just add tasks, you can add algorithms, and you just click run and it will run all the algorithms and all the data sets. Moa, very similarly, you can download tasks and then run any streamlined algorithm on if you want. Uh, there are also graphical interfaces like WebMiner and Nine. Here you can just have uh, operators that do the, what the data streams through, and here we just have uh, an operator that downloads the data and, and, and everything else for OpenML. Then you can do whatever you want with the data, and at the end there's an upload um, component that uploads the result. Um, if you use Python or R, uh, there's a library which has a few commands and in like four or five lines of code you can actually download data, build your model up. Let me give a short example. Um, in Python, for instance, it looks like this. Uh, it's very short. Uh, it's just, these, these, these are just imports. And then you connect with username and password, you download data set number three. Oops, the number three. Thirty one. You can also search, but this is just to make it short. Um, you make a data frame out of the data set. You build um, a classifier and a forest classifier using a library called Scikit-Learn. You fit uh, the classifier, and now that's your model. That's just five lines of code, and you've done the data and built a model on it. Um, you can do also more interesting stuff. So here, um, I specify a number of uh, algorithms, and I want to see what the performance versus the runtime is, and I can plot them to this just plotting code. So here, oops, so here I see for different algorithms how, how accurate versus how fast they are. And well, typically you see the decision trees, they're uh, very good, very fast, random forests, they're a bit slower, but typically the, the average performance is much better. Okay, um, and then in R, it looks like this. So again, we have, you can search for number of data sets. So here I look for data sets that have uh, between, I want to do a quick experiment, but I don't have time. So I look for small data sets, uh, which have no missing values. Um, then I create a, a learner called LD8, linear discriminant analysis. And then I write a little loop where I download the task, run the learner, get and upload the results. And I just loop over this and uh, R will just run all these experiments up the results and then afterwards I can download the results and show them. And what's different from before is that now I can download not just, not just my experiments, I can download anybody's experiments, right? So I can run, compare my experiments with anybody else's and just import them and visualize them. Sure. Could you just go back to the previous slide? Uh, the previous slide? 
third one, yes. So what's the, the vertical axis? AUC? AUC is aerial rock curve. It's a very common uh, performance measure for models. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the accuracy of the model, how accurately it predicts what it needs to predict. Okay, right. Is that, that's kind of a universal pair of measures that runs across all different machine learning techniques. This is just performance per accuracy versus time. Uh, it's a trading okay. time. Right. So if, if you are in top in, on the left, you're very fast. If you're on top, you're very good. Right. So here's Simon and Forrester. They're, they're not very fast, but they're very good. Uh, the Simon trees are very, very fast. Uh, they're not as good as Simon and Forrester. And so on. Right. If you compare it to the algorithms. Yes, you see yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question. If, if you want to know which algorithms you, you may try, this kind of things show you, may, may tell you um, which one you can try. If you're really interested in speed, maybe you want to try this one. If you're more, more interested in accuracy, you maybe want to try this one. If, if you don't get a, a sort of what appears to be a, a big sort of contoured hill or something like that, mm -hmm. and you, you, you appear to get some kind of peak represented by contours, mm -hmm. uh, that second one along at the top seems to have you know, sort of the thing happening very much. What, what does that tell you? Is you're not using the right method? Or? It just tells me that this algorithm, which is um, one R, this is a very simple rule in there. Mm -hmm. It's not very good. So accuracy is very in the middle, uh, but it's very fast. It's just a way to, to explore right. how, how good different algorithms are. Mm -hmm. And this is just an average overall data set. Right? Typically, you want to have, you, you can do all kinds of analysis. So what OpenML just gives you is, it gives you all the results, and you can do any metric. This is AUC, so OpenML calculates over. 40 different kind of metrics. So if you're more interested in precision or recall, you can just download that and visualize it. Thank you. This is very, very well. Uh, Sorry, I, I made you go back once. So. Um, so yeah, again, per, per algorithm, uh, we keep track of how good they are. So go to this is Ben Forest, Ben Forest is a very well known machine learning algorithm. Again, you get a wiki, which is very short still. Please go in there and edit it. Um, you get a description of all, what all the parameters mean, and then you have a visualization. So here you have all the different data sets that people uploaded, and you can see how good this algorithm performs on all the different data sets. Again, every doctor is a model, uh, and uh, it's, it's scored by, by AUC. But no, this is scored by accuracy. Uh, you can just change it. If you click here, you can see that you will have a large list of all different kind of metrics uh, that you can use. You can also implement your own metrics and add it to the platform if you want. Uh, you can also highlight uh, parameters, so maybe you're interested. Oh, I, okay, I don't have a network. <laughs> uh, oh, I um, so here I'm color coding um, the results uh, by the number of trees in the forest. So red means a large number, uh, blue means a small number. And you can see typically the more trees in the forest, the better your performance is. Uh, but this is not always the case. You will find data sets where uh, this behavior is different uh, from other ones. Sometimes it even gives you poor results. Uh, this is just a way to see what the effect of the parameter is, and this may help you actually choose the right parameter. Finally, you have the runs. So anytime you run a flow on a task, it gives you a result, and that result is encapsulated as a run. If a run gives you all the results that were expected, this gives evaluations, predictions, uh, it's linked to the data, it's linked to the, the, the code, it's linked to the authors, uh, and it's all organized online. So you can just compare all the evaluations any way you want, any metric, uh, any data, any flow. So you can just uh, run to the data any way you want. Um, if you look at, because it's crucial that you need a lot of information about uh, the run. This is an example of one single run. So here I have, this is one of the big prediction uh, problems. Um, so this is an experiment run by uh, this girl. Oh boy. Um, do you see the ground settings that she used? You can see the description, uh, the models, the predictions, full instance level predictions that she returned. 
Uh, and you see for all the different evaluation metrics, we don't just give the score, we also compute the uh, standard deviation, the per class distribution, we show distribution uh, over course validation faults, so you can use it for statistical analysis. And you can also download the, the, all the, the nitty gritty details uh, to do your own analysis. So this is data that's fit to be used in any kind of research because it's very detailed. We do all kinds of we compute costs, uh, CPU time. So this experiment, on, on average, takes 35 seconds to train. Um, how much memory it uses, it gets important computer matrices. Um, also things, um, information about your, the machine, like the OS, uh, how fast it is. So here we have some benchmarking results. Uh, it's just a score uh, of how fast your machine is. Um, so it's good to know that if you want to compare runtimes or different algorithms and so on. And again, you can discuss this result if you want. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let's open up the mail. So we're still in beta, we started about a year and a half ago, uh, but it's already used all over the world, even though some things are completely unfinished. Um, it's used a lot in the US, uh, Russia, and, 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 and Europe especially. Uh, we have a great community of open source developers that contribute code, that build all kinds of improvements. If you have a problem, we're typically very fast in responding. Uh, we have about 450 uh, active users, Many more passive ones. We get about 200 people visiting per day. We have lots of data that flows, but this is just the start. Right? Um, we are doing all kinds of things to uh, connect to scientific community, so we can import much more data sets, much more uh, flows in there. So, okay. yeah. so GitHub and OpenML is the same thing? No, 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 no. no. Um, GitHub. Oh, sorry. On GitHub. <laughs> it should be on GitHub. Um, so GitHub is just a collaboration tool for, uh, for programmers. So all our code is on GitHub. It's okay. all open source. It's an open source platform. Right. Um, and so we use GitHub uh, as a way to uh, all the different people involved to work on the code. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting type. <laughs> okay. Uh, what we're working on uh, right now is circles. So we want to be able to um, we work on a problem with a group of scientists. Maybe there's sensitive data in there that you don't want to share just yet. So uh, we will, that will be possible to do. Uh, projects are a way to uh, group data into a uh, project, which basically is an electronic paper. So if you write a synthetic paper, you can put a link in there. The link will point to a web page here uh, in which you have all the code, all your data, all the experiments, and all the details. Um, and vice versa, you can link this, uh, this e-paper to your published paper uh, to count how many people look at it. Just an extension of your scientific papers. Uh, all the metrics, we will measure how, what the impact is of your work, uh, how much people reuse it. So if you upload the data, we track how many times people reuse your data in other kind of research, how much time those, those, uh, that, 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 that research ends up being published and so on. Because currently it's not uh, tracking the use of data sets and code in the literature is not very good. We're also working at towards distributed computing. So it's interesting, to, it's important to know that OpenML doesn't compute uh, doesn't all the models for you. So it, does, it gives you the data, you run the experiments on your machine, on your cluster, on your GPUs, whatever, on the cloud, and you upload the result back to the server. What we want to do is to make it a little bit easier is to create jobs. So you can say, you can go on OpenML and say, okay, I want to run all these algorithms and all these data sets, and OpenML will just create a batch of experiments for you, and you can just, and there will be um, like a runner, a simple tool, helper tool that you run on your cluster or your cloud that just uh, goes into a loop and just asks OpenML, do you have a problem for me? Yes, okay, I'll solve it, and we'll do this experimentation. So you can distribute your computer. Um, we're also, I, could, I will come back to this, but we're also working on algorithm selection and hyperparameter tuning. Because we have all these experiments online, uh, we can actually um, help you select algorithms and help you uh, tune your parameters. And we're working on um, integrated, integrated, integrating this into a platform. So for instance, you can upload a data set and OpenML can tell you which models uh, will be good to try, uh, how good performance you can expect. 
from these algorithms and so on. And it will continuously improve because as more and more, as it tries more and more things on more and more data sets and more and more people uh, contribute their own experience, it will learn from all of this and uh, know which kind of models work well and which kind of data. We're also linking to scientific communities, which our rocket science very good community of uh, uh, scientists that makes their data uh, available in an easy to use fashion. So we're hoping to connect to millions more data sets, also more uh, different more formats. Um, we're also link linking to more code repositories, um, also improving APIs. We hope to include statistical analysis, so it OpenML kind of advises you which kind of uh, how you should analyze your data, just advises you. Uh, and if you want to create new tasks, uh, it shows these. Um, so you also use OpenML in the classroom. Uh, this was actually a challenge uh, for students. So they had a, an, an assignment, and they, the assignment was just you have this complex data set, was a very large data set, um, and they would have to build the best model on it. And you could see all the students uh, learning from each other doing this. Like I explained. Um, now what's interesting is that they really, really enjoyed this. Um, this first is a tweet. Uh, by students saying, hey guys, look, this is proven, I'm studying on a Sunday. Right? So he, his parents, his friends can see when he is experimenting and, and how good he's doing. It really creates an, an encouraging environment for students to do work. What's also interesting is that after the assignment finished, students were still trying to improve their scores. Okay. Ultimately, of course, the goal is to, to bridge these gaps in data-driven science, right? Um, we want to bring the data scientists and the domain scientists and the tool developers together on the same platform uh, so they can help each other. And we get rid of all these camps and it's just one community. So, we can create a collaboratory, an online platform where domain scientists and data scientists can work together online. Which means that domain scientists can extract their data sets they're interested in, uh, upload, upload them to, to or link them to the tool, and a data scientist can look at it and try their algorithms on it. So with the results, the domain scientists can see uh, what the data science community is doing. They can see which models are, are good uh, to try. Um, and vice versa, the, the, the data scientist gains a lot of data sets to benchmark its algorithms. Right? So this publication is great, right? The data scientist, he needs lots of data sets to test his algorithm. The more you data sets you can test it on, the better your paper gets. Um, you can really show, and actually you can discover where your data is, where your algorithm is valuable. Uh, because right now, you publish a paper about an algorithm and you say, look, it's good because it's good on all these data sets. Right now, if you use this platform and everybody is there, um, you, can, you can just run your algorithm on different um, real scientific data sets and you can say, look, my algorithm is very useful for this kind of brain research and this is actually being used by, by neuroscientists right now. So if, if, if you have this connection, it's much more uh, powerful to discover where your algorithms are being used. For the main scientists, it's just very great because they, they get to, to see which algorithms that run very good on their data without having to go to the literature and study all these algorithms. And if they have questions, they can just communicate online. Also to developers, they can, uh, can look at the, the newest algorithms and implementing better and, and data science can maybe help them also. Um, okay. And it's all in real time. Um, you can just the data scientists can just run this algorithm, and the second it's finished, the, the domain scientists can already see what's happening. Right? There's no delay whatsoever. And you can even automate the whole thing. If I have a good algorithm, I can just put it into the platform and just ask it to look at new data sets. And if my algorithm can run it, just run it, run it on the data set automatically. So the main scientist, he just publishes a data set and automatically algorithms are being run on it. Uh, this also creates a huge potential for uh, new discoveries. So what we will end up with is networked data-driven science. You have a platform that's linked to all the data repositories, the code repositories, and there's all these people uh, uploading code, uh, building models, um, giving suggestions and so on. It becomes a huge community. Now, because you have all this data there, and all these people there, it becomes possible to automate a lot of these things. Maybe you don't need to wait for scientists to 
give you a model, maybe the, the tool, the, the environment will recommend a model for you. So we can actually involve, so we, can, we can build services that automate certain processes like cleaning data, selecting algorithms, optimizing parameters, and post processing of your data. So the, the scientists, they can just ask a tool to do it for them. If you imagine the machine learning pipeline, it looks something like this. So you start out collecting your data, you have to spend a lot of time cleaning it, coding it in the right way so you can run it, um, you can run, run machine learning methods on it, defining your metrics, selecting your algorithms, optimizing the parameters, and afterwards you have to post-process your models, then you have to put them in practice, uh, and then basically you start over. When it does work, you have to start over, uh, collecting more data, coding differently, selecting other algorithms, and so on. It's, it's, uh, it's a huge pipeline of different things to do, and you can imagine many different people doing this. Now you can actually uh, add AI in as well. Processes, um, and services that help these people do this. Right? Even in some cases, you can even replace them all together. For instance, in the case of optimizing parameters, this, this is a field that's very mature, and you can actually there are very good algorithms already out there that will optimize your parameters automatically for you. So maybe you don't need people there. You can just build a service for it. So yeah, parameter optimization. Um, there's many different ways in which you can optimize the parameters of your model. Uh, you can do it manually, but it's, it's surprisingly suboptimal. Even if you think you have a good model, it often shows that you're, you may be miles off the best model that you can use. You can do a grid search. You can try all different parameter combinations. Um, it, it only works if you have a very small number of parameters because it's a combinatorial uh, explosion, of course. It takes a huge amount of time if you have a large number of parameters, so in many cases people just pick one or two parameters and just leave the rest alone. You can do random search, which is just randomly take uh, uh, parameter combinations, which is better typically than, than grid search, uh, and it's better if you have a large number of parameters. But the best thing you can do is Bayesian optimization, which is it's very good at large number of parameters and intelligently, it's also more quickly, intelligently chooses the, the parameter to, to use this. Um, when you talk about parameter optimization, when you talk about optimization through um, search methods, through the parameter values and the values, yeah. or are you talking yeah. actually about pure prediction of parameters, which, which doesn't execute normally? No, it does execute normally. It does execute That's good. Yeah. It's also, it's also called hyperparameter optimization for this reason. Yeah, but it, it's a kind of parameter optimization search rather than optimization. Yeah, it's a kind of search. Yeah. It's, not, it's an optimization of okay. the parameter okay. space okay. of models, yeah. of algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any relationship between these um, feature selection? There, there are all kinds of combinations, that's true. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm first going to take a look individually. Uh, but there is an, obviously an interaction there, so it becomes much more complex. And any time you change the data, you have to rerun the optimization. And, so on. and specifically, selection and optimization, they, they can't be confused together. But the then this feature selection from set of features that you have, is that, does that mean parameter optimization? No, feature selection would be, okay, I didn't really add it, but uh, there will be something here, I think. Where you have all the data, then you select features, and then you build your models. Um, but yeah, you would, you, would also, you would also have to repeat over that um, to build. Because you have these wrapper methods and feature selection where you have to do this right to explore which uh, features are really useful. Okay, I'll quickly show you how Bayesian optimization works. Typically, this is the function that you want to, to optimize. This can be the effect of a parameter, and you want, to get, you want to know which parameter value is very good to use. Uh, so you start out with running experiments, and as you run some experiments, you see, because uh, you, you, you don't know this function to begin with, right? so you just sample it. You just try some parameter settings, and you see this is the performance that these get. The next thing you do is you build a posterior model. So basically, this is typically a Gaussian model, so if you have a point that you measured, you're very sure about it, right? So you have a very high probability, and uh, you basically know it, 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 it won't be anything here, it, it's, it's, it's considered there. If you have a point between them, there's a, large, um, uh, a larger uh, variation. So you can say, okay, probably the value is something between here, but I don't know. That's, that's my uncertainty about the value of the data. Right? 
So then you define exploration strategy, which you can include this the uncertainty. Uh, it's also called an acquisition function, and there you, this function gives you um, which point is more interesting to uh, evaluate next. Right? So you just optimize uh, this acquisition function. It tells you this is the highest value, so now I'm going to evaluate this point. Then you run your model, you evaluate it, you get a new data point here, and, and your posterior model uh, changes. So now you've learned a little bit more. And basically what you do is you repeat. So you keep building this acquisition function and you, you select the parameter values which are more interesting to you. And you do this not for one parameter, but you can do this for tens or maybe hundreds of parameters. So this is an intelligent way of searching your uh, parameter space. So it, it, it only runs experiments that are the most interesting to, to test. Next. This is, a, this is a service you can offer. Um, there's also a work in, in algorithm selection. You can do meta learning, so you learn the relationship between properties of your data and the performance of your algorithm. So, if, if you have this meta model, uh, you can give it any data set and it will look at the properties and then say, okay, I think these and these algorithms are best to learn about. You can also do something called active testing where you sequentially read the best algorithm, then you look at that you actually run it on the data, you see how good it is, and you use the evaluation score and you learn from it. So, the next time you know, okay, this data actually maybe different than I expected, so you, you, you uh, use it to get better predictions the next time. You can also build recommender systems, like recommending a movie, in this case you recommend an algorithm, you could for the asset. So here's crucial that you uh, define good uh, data properties, if you work on streams or graphs or different. Um, and typically this is combined with parameter optimization, so you want to pick the algorithm and the parameter at the same time. Uh, this is a study did with, with drug discovery. Um, so there are many kinds of. Um, this is for malaria research. So there are different kinds of malaria that we don't have medicine for because the pharmaceutical industry is just not interested in researching this because there's too few people who have this kind of uh, disease. Uh, but we have huge databases of molecules, prior drugs that have been tried. So we can extract all the data. Um, so every data set here um, is activity of all different molecules, drugs, on certain uh, protein that you want to block. Um, and then you fingerprint it with all kinds of metrics. And you build tens of thousands, tens of, thousands of these um, data sets. You run all kinds of models on it. First of all, you learn which models run best on it. So you can see whether forest is very good, which regression is also very good. Uh, and, top, and then you can uh, build a meta model that predicts uh, Depending on the properties um, of the asset, or the specific enzyme that you're dealing with, which are the best machine learning algorithms to try, and which are the best ways of fingerprinting the, 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 the molecules. Could you, be, could you be given some of that information a priori, uh, that kind of tree thing that you've got? Is that some kind of dependence? Or is it? No, sorry, it's how do I interpret that tree? This tree tells you, so it looks at properties of the data. So it looks, for instance, What's the mutual information, statistical measure between the, 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 the predictive features and the target feature? Right? So if there is a if the if the features are very predictive of the data set, this may depend, this may influence the algorithm you want to use. Uh, other things are the, the size of data sets, uh, the number of features is very important. So some algorithms are very good with large number of features. Actually, the number of features is the top um, uh, value uh, uh, variable here. And based on the process of the data, it tells you uh, which algorithms will give you the best result. And you, you train, so you have all these data sets, you train all these models, and then you learn what's the relationship between the process of the data and the models. And that's your tree. Okay, I think I'm more used to trees representing some kind of dependency between different parameters. This is more about splitting, deciding yeah. how to split. So yeah. Yeah. Um, we also some work on, on fast algorithm selection. So here you um, you want to predict algorithms very fast. So you can do uh, meta learning or algorithm optimization, and it can take weeks to run. Uh, but if you are smart about uh, testing your algorithms on smaller samples of a data set, you can give predictions very fast. So here you see uh, this is the, this is the loss. 
So in this case, if you are here, you, um, your algorithm is 10% of the best algorithm that you can get. Uh, and this is the time, so between one second and, I don't know, 70,000 seconds. So you can see that most algorithms, they try, they tr most of these meta algorithms, selection algorithms, they try a model, it takes, in this case, uh, 300 seconds to run, they have a result, and because of this result, they're the best algorithm is within 8%, right? And then they keep doing this, they run more algorithms, and every time a model finishes, uh, they can either uh, keep it, um, so if, if the performance improves, they keep it, if the performance is not better, they just go to the next one and so on. So you can see how these test case now. Um, our approach here, what else? It tests on small samples of data. Some of here also test on small samples of data, but we use some multi-objective evaluation to be faster. Um, and here you see that within, within one second, we can give you an algorithm that's only 2% of the best performance. And if you can wait for a thousand uh, seconds, it's actually quite close to, to zero, within one percent of the best algorithm. Um, and this is the average over, I think, 70 different data sets. So just to show that it really works, you, you can get good predictions, good mod, uh, algorithms to try in a very short amount of time. These are areas where uh, it would be great if there's more research into it. And if you're a machine learning researcher, I think I encourage you to go into this area because there's a lot of uh, things you can do there if you want to automate this. For instance, maybe you want uh, to, to spot problems in data sets and cleaning. You may want to automatically detect the, 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 the types of different variables, detect missing values, because missing values are not always nicely indicated. Maybe zero or minus ones are a thing that you want to, to intelligently know if something is a missing value or not. You want to detect the knowledge in your data. Um, Auto coding, because different algorithms uh, require different codings. Some algorithms work on purely numerical data, others don't care, they work with categorical and numerical data, and so on. So, depending on the algorithm that you want to do, you have to recode the data set, right? to find different features. Um, then you want to detect change in the data, because data is a living, evolving thing. So if you are analyzing sensor data, sometimes the sensor breaks, or it's human error or your database changes. And the model that you built before suddenly becomes very bad. And if you don't detect this, then you're using a model uh, that is very bad because something broke in your data. So it's important that you detect those changes uh, and, and, and act on them. There's also feedback loops. This is very, very hard to solve. Um, but imagine that you work in a hospital and you build a model that's now used by doctors. This means that doctors are going to um, use this model to, to, uh, to get better treatments, and this will change the data. So by implementing the model, you're changing the data, and the data that you originally trained your algorithm with has changed. So the model has been trained on all data, and by using it, the data has changed. So this is a feedback loop uh, that you need to spot. Um, you can do it with, uh, with the, the change detection. Um, something to, that you should uh, be aware about. And there's also leakage. Sometimes there's some information in the data that you give to the model that, that the model should not see. Uh, sometimes people, by mistake, they put the actual target value as one of the features. Uh, or there are some um, other kind of connections that, that should not be in the data and you should be able to detect it. And OpenML, actually, OpenML, for instance, OpenML detects when, um, or you can easily see when somebody uh, does this or uh, puts a, a variable there that just gives you random numbers. So in the end, what you hope to go to in the next maybe 10 years is to create this, an AI for data-driven research, a tool that scientists can use to do their work much more efficiently. So this AI will be symbiotic. It will learn from the way people do machine learning. So if you look, it would have all the data sets, all the evaluations, the, the workflows, it will see how people build their workflows and can learn from this um, to, to learn which workflows work well on which data. So if you are working in a um, gene expression data set, it will learn in this area which are the common techniques, uh, which work very well and so on. So if you are a beginning researcher, uh, this will give, uh, tell you um, which workflows you can try. And it would collaborate with science. It doesn't take over. 
it doesn't replace scientists, it collaborates with them. So it takes care of all the tedious error prone tasks like living data, finding similar data sets, trying all the state of the art algorithms automatically, uh, setting algorithms, configuring them, and so on. So the, the domain scientist doesn't have to bother with this. He just tells you, I'm interested in doing this. Um, can you recommend an algorithm? Can you remove these outliers? So, and, and, and the scientist and the AI can do that for him. Basically, what you do, you couple human expertise and machine learning, right? So, we had, first we had AI in the 60s. Uh, so, oh, we're going to replace all human thinking by, by, by AI agents. Uh, that didn't work, right? But what did happen is that we have uh, graphical user interfaces, we have the internet, all these things evolved. Um, because we use computers to make our lives easier, but not to replace us. And it's very similar here, right? So we, use, we build a system that takes care of all the things that we don't really want to spend our time on, uh, can find the assets, connect to the right person, and so on. So the human can follow hunches, uh, learn about things, um, tell the system what you should try next, and so on. Uh, so it's a real coupling between what the humans feel uh, and know and what the computer can do efficiently. Um, so finally, you can imagine a conversation like this where uh, a domain scientist has a new data set and gives it to the, to the system and it gives you a report with some information about the data set. Maybe there's some, uh, this tells you there's outliers or there's missing values that you should be aware about. It should then, it can, uh, the person can then ask the computer to like, remove the outliers and the computer can do this and tell, okay, does it look okay? And the person can say, yes, now I want to predict the uh, target. Uh, column X, and the machine can then go to work and uh, try different algorithms and give you some models. And while it's doing that, the uh, human can ask, so are there any similar data sets? And then the system can browse its use database to see which similar data sets there are, uh, which papers are written about them, so the scientists can then look at that. Uh, she can ask which are the state of the art algorithms right now, and the computer can tell that to her and tell them who to be in touch to go in touch with. Um, or you can ask very specific things like what's the difference between algorithm A and algorithm B and maybe the computer can then tell, give a comparison. Uh, for instance, algorithm B is very good if you have a large number of features because the algorithm A is very uh, bad at it. So ultimately, um, you can imagine all these people <coughs> working together and solving hard problems. And it sort of reminds me of, of these birds that you have to see also in the North England. So these are starlings, uh, especially at night. In the evening, you can see them form these huge clusters of science. And this is a, this is a huge collaboration. Right? There are many birds, and they go all together in the sky. And the reason they go all together into the sky is to protect themselves against dangers. This they can be uh, typically happens when you have a predator, like a falcon, that's trying to, to capture a single bird. And of course, the bird, one of these. Um, where it's not powerful enough to chase uh, to predator away, but if they all go up into the air, they can actually be much more safe and, and deter these predators. Sometimes you can actually see them, uh, here you see the predator, and you can see how the birds are really chasing the predator away. And it's kind of a metaphor about what we can do if we want to tackle health problems. If you want to tackle global warming, if you want to tackle uh, diseases like cancer, if, and all age, all kinds of, of uh, societal problems. It's very hard to tackle them by ourselves. But if we can connect online, if we can uh, collaborate with the right people, if people who are really interested in solving a problem can help people, other people uh, do that, then you can create this huge collaboration. You can solve problems that are maybe impossible to solve today. Thank you.